I've been here. So some new, new direction that will take us through the summer anyway. So the parables of Jesus. A parable is a short allegorical story designed to illustrate or teach some truth, religious principle, or moral lesson. It's a statement that conveys meaning indirectly by the use of comparison, analogy, or the like. The idea of conveying meaning indirectly is important to understand these parables because the meaning in them that may look obvious actually isn't obvious. Because that's the point of the parable. That there's there's always meaning underneath. There's an indirect meaning. That's really the, the true meaning behind things. Uh, there's a certain myth with the parables that I've actually heard. Uh, and that is that Jesus told stories in order to make it more accessible and understanding to the people. I've heard it in the context of Complaining, complaining about their pastor's sermon, that it wasn't that easy to follow, it didn't make any sense. Why doesn't he just oh, why doesn't he just teach in parables like Jesus did so that everybody can understand what he's trying to say? Well, that's actually the exact opposite of why Jesus taught in parables. Uh, look up look up Jesus' reason for using parables. Matthew 13, 10 to 15, and Mark 4, 10 to 12. Matthew 13, 10 to 15. Am I not on? All right. Okay, now I bet I am. And Mark 4, 10 to 12. And again, looking at Jesus' reason for why he taught in parables. Mark 4, 10 to 12. Start with Matthew 13, 10 to 15. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the heart of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. And then in Mark is virtually the same thing. Mark 4, 10 to 12. But when he was alone, those uh, around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. So the truth of Jesus' parables is that he taught in parables so that seeing they would not see and hearing they would not hear because the meaning was hidden. Now the first asterisk on the handout. Because of the lack of understanding in the people, Jesus taught in such a way as to further confound them. Now the question, why would he do such a thing? You know, isn't the point of teaching to bring people out of ignorance? Why would God want people to stay ignorant? Because this, this particular kind of no, seeing they had to see and knowing they had to know was not of logic. It was of faith. And they needed the Holy Spirit to open their understanding so that they could right so that they could know via the Holy Spirit so that it could be a matter of faith not their own human strength and they were a people who were very dependent on their human strength they believed that's what it was to be a child of God to exercise their own selves under the law so Jesus had to come along and teach them that it's not up to you so he puts the knowledge they need just out of reach of knowledge they need the Holy Spirit to give them this so what exactly was it they were supposed to see and not see and hear and they didn't hear? 
Jesus mentions this repeatedly, in fact. So what was it they, they weren't getting that they were supposed to be able to get in order to understand the parables? Yes, they had a wrong analogy of faith. An analogy of faith is... An analogy of faith is, is sort of like the big picture. You have to know, your analogy of faith is to know that God loves you, for starters, that you're saved by grace, not of yourselves. Um, you know, Jesus is true God and true man. You know, basically the creed that, that he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, that this was all for you. This is God's plan of salvation. This is how he, how he worked out your eternal life. But you also believe in God, the Creator, you know, Father, Maker of heaven and earth. You believe in the Holy Spirit, who gives faith and nurtures faith. You understand that this isn't of yourselves. It's all of God. That's your analogy of faith. It's, it's kind of like the, the faith in a nutshell. And this is why we have creeds to teach that analogy of faith from, from little on and then repeat it weekly for the rest of our lives so we can constantly be immersed in this is, our, this is the faith that we confess. So that when anything comes up, the way we look at it is through the lens of this analogy of faith. Now, if you have a wrong analogy of faith, this is what happens. Everything you look at is through the lens of a wrong analogy of faith. So, for instance, if you are, say, a Calvinist and you believe in double predestination, that, that God picked some to go to hell before the creation of the world so that when they were born into this world to go to hell and there's nothing that can be done to save them because they're destined for hell. If you believe that, then your view of Jesus coming into this world, your view of Christmas is different. Because Jesus didn't come to save the world. He came to announce forgiveness to those that God had predestined to be saved, but to do nothing for those who were already condemned to hell. You know, your view of Jesus on the cross and his death, completely different. Jesus now died only for those who were elected, not for the rest of the world. So one little shift in your analogy of faith changes everything you see. Your entire view of the gospel has now been negatively affected because Jesus isn't there to save the world anymore. He's only there to save his little group of people that God has picked. Uh, and that also means that those who go to hell, it isn't their fault. They were picked that way. Every, every religion, every denomination in a way, has its own little analogy of faith its own particular things it puts together and says, this is the faith you have to believe it and judge everything by. It's also why sometimes it's, it's hard to logically understand why you just can't make some people see something that's so obvious right in front of them. I'm sure you've had this experience, when, especially when you're talking about biblical things. It's right there. How can you not see this? You know, uh, Like with baptism things. God flat out says, baptism saves you. His, his word says, word for word, you know, receive the Holy Spirit in baptism. Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away. Every, everything it has to say is right there. How can you not see that? How can you still think baptism is about what we do? You know, it's our work, our decision. How can you possibly think that with all the things the Bible says? Because your analogy of faith is messed up. You're now, you approach the faith with the underlying belief that it's your decision that's ultimately the point of difference between going to heaven and hell. So everything you see in the Bible is all about your decision, your doing. Uh, even though out of one side of your mouth you say Jesus saves you, your analogy of faith is ultimately that, but really it's my decision that saves me. And that affects everything. So when we plug this back into here, 
Their problem was a wrong analogy of faith. What was their analogy of faith? Well, it was ultimately that salvation rested in their relationship to the law. That it was not rooted in the mercy and grace of God, it was rooted in the law of God. So everything they saw was affected by that. They were incapable of seeing Jesus as their savior because they still believed that God was saving them somehow rooted in the law. And Jesus was not that. So even though it was right in front of their face, seeing they would see, they wouldn't perceive it. Hearing they would hear, they wouldn't understand it. Just like we run into with you know, baptism discussions in our day. All right, comments or, or thoughts? Absolutely, that was all part of their analogy of faith. That was part of the law. God's law said he was going to save the children of Abraham. So they took that as their salvation is locked up no matter what, and they just kind of excluded all those parts that talked about their need of grace and forgiveness. Their need of a savior. You know, they had, they had the basics of faith, and this is the frustrating faith when you have a frustrating thing when you have a messed up analogy of faith. You can have all the elements there, but just not be able to put them together right. They understood God was going to send a Messiah. They understood all the Old Testament prophecies. You know, the letter of it all they got. But they didn't get the fact this Messiah wasn't a political leader, he was a savior. They didn't understand that he was going to lead by sacrificing himself. They were, they were vested in the idea of God restoring power to Israel. So they were looking for a powerful Messiah figure. Jesus comes as a weak savior figure. Absolutely. Absolutely they are. All right. So this, this is what's messed up and what Jesus has to break through. This is why he teaches in parables, because they're not getting it. And he's, he's forcing the matter, really, to be something grasped by the Holy Spirit alone and, and not by the, the logic they were bringing, which was messed up at the core. Now, compare as an example John chapter 12, verses 37 to 50. Because there are some who may look at this and say, well, that's, that's not fair. You know, Jesus' job is, uh, any teacher's job is to teach and to lead people out of error into truth. And Jesus did that. He certainly did that. That's right. Yes. Jesus does not feed this stuff logically forces them to have to invest something of their self in, in figuring it out. And again, that's the role of the Holy Spirit. John 12, 37 to 50. Let's see. But although he had done so many things before them, they did not believe him. See, this. why couldn't they believe him? Because their analogy of faith was messed up. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. Because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw the glory and spoke of him. See, there's the same verses quoted again. Uh, Nevertheless, even among rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. Now that is the analogy of faith he's teaching, the core of it all. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. But the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. 
And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So Jesus does, in fact, teach about this core of faith, namely that he and the Father are one. It's just that their basic thinking is so messed up from the beginning that they're, they're just not getting it. So just because in the parables Jesus doesn't spoon-feed it to them doesn't mean that elsewhere Jesus isn't actually laying this out so that they can get it. And here he is, but once more they can't get it. They, they cannot, in fact, as it says in verse 39, therefore they could not believe. It's not just that they weren't trying hard enough. They couldn't because they didn't have the, the right faith to start with, even though they had all the elements of right faith. Now, this is part of the necessity of repetition of the creeds. Even teaching the creeds to our children before they can read. They should know God created the heavens and the earth. Because that builds that analogy of faith. In these churches nowadays that never use the creeds, never recite the Lord's Prayer, because they don't think it's heartfelt enough. That, that's right. It's vain repetition. That's, that's part of why their views are so messed up about everything. Because they don't have that basic analogy of faith. They have rejected it in favor of some personalized thing. And that's not the faith. That repetition is never vain. Uh, you know, if it, granted, if you, just, if you totally block it out and you're just mumbling words, but... You know, especially with children, repetition used to be understood as a good thing in teaching. Oh, there's an expression for it, to re repetition is something or other. Not, not the mother of invention, that's something else. But, um, you know, basically a, a mother, it teaches, it nurtures. Exactly right. Yeah. Right. In theory, I couldn't. But, <laughs> but you, if you have the basic building blocks of your math facts, then you can move on to other more difficult things, and you don't have to think about right. the foundation. But, but don't you, as a teacher, see that there's, there's kind of a fundamental shift in, in education theory where it used to be understood that memorization was kind of the core right. of teaching. And now just teaching in general do kids memorize the, the multiplication tables like we had to when we were kids? They don't tell us that you have them do it, but yeah. any teacher who knows what's going on. That's right. It, it common that. sense tells you they should have to have it. Flashcards, yeah. But there, there, there is just in general a world view that, that affects everything, including just secular education theory, that, that devalues repetition in, in comparison to what 50 years ago, you know, repetition was and how it was viewed. Uh, I still, in confirmation class, insist kids memorize Bible verses, you know, memorize the catechism, memorize it. And that's a minority thing. Most churches do not do that anymore because, again, their whole idea is repetition is, you know, not necessary. We don't have to build that, that core foundation. Uh, but you know, you can see what happens when you don't. What you're building is an analogy of faith that will enable somebody to analyze anything according, according to a certain body of understanding. And without that body of understanding, it's, you know, it's a crapshoot. Anything can happen. So this is, this is why the parables are what they are and why Jesus taught the way he did. This very problem. Do you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah we, I mean, I really, that, I, that. I do. Mm -hmm. That's just personal, but I do. We should, uh, and there is an option for it even during, during uh, Vespers or Matins to use the, the Apostles' Creed instead of, uh, or any non-communion service. It's simple. Yeah, it is. It is simple. So maybe we should be using those and using it in all our non-communion services. <coughs> but yeah, I mean, traditionally when it comes to communion services, they always use the Nicene. But yeah. Uh, any other thoughts before we press on? 
All right, looking now at what we just read in John 12, 37 to 50, look in verse 46 particularly. I have come as a light into the world. Whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Now here again, Jesus is speaking somewhat you know, parabolically. We see, we see two human problems present uh, in the behavior of people. It says in verse 42, among the rulers many believed, but because of the Pharisees they didn't confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They were frightened to death of what would happen if people knew they actually believed, so they didn't. But that confession, confessing him before people who disagree is part of this analogy of faith they had to have. So even though they might have believed some core things, they still didn't get it, and it was still out of their reach. So we have two basic problems being presented here, outright denial of God and this kind of secret faith that hides but is afraid to be seen. And Jesus doesn't seem to have any more patience for those who choose to stay in darkness because of peer pressure than those who outright deny him. And consider how important it is to be able to stand alone and to teach our kids to be able to stand alone without fear. This is part of the analogy of faith that that we, we just understand and have to teach our kids. There will come times when you're the only one standing there believing this. And everybody else in the room is going to think there's something wrong with you because you don't see it the way they see it. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid to confess him even if the world is standing against you. And we have some, some of these marvelous hymns about, you know, though the gates of hell stand against us. Uh, that's part of the analogy of faith that they didn't get. They wanted to have it both ways. They wanted the world's praise and they wanted, they wanted Jesus. And you, you can't have both. Now, Uh, Understanding the parables then presupposes right faith. Uh, You have to understand Jesus' grace, God's forgiveness, uh, God's trinity, uh, the, the offering of the Father, of his own Son. All of those things have to come together really for the parables to make any sense at all. In Mark 4, we see that the explanation of the parables was reserved for a, a precious few. Mark 4, 33 to 34, and with many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it, but without a parable he did not speak to them, and when they were alone he explained things to his disciples. When Jesus taught publicly, it was always in parables. When Jesus was alone with those where he was building this analogy of faith, his disciples, then he explained everything to them. Presumably, because he knew they were going to be the teachers that would be left behind and they would be the ones to go out and explain these things now. But he he only explained it to those who had this kind of built understanding of him as Savior. Exactly right. They don't get this stuff until after the resurrection and after Pentecost, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes to them and opens up their minds. So much of this remains closed to them until then. All right, so here are the basic parables of Jesus. We see that not all the Gospels have all the parables. Uh, There are some, like the one we'll look at today, where all three Gospels have it, but others where, like, uh, you know, Good Samaritan, only Luke. So this is what we will be pressing forward with through the next, next several months. So let's take a look at the first one, the parable of of the lamp. This occurs in three of the four Gospels. Yeah, notice John conspicuously absent from that list of parables. Uh, John's a very different Gospel. It records very different things and does not record the parables of Jesus so much. So, Matthew 5, print it out. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? 
It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. All right? Now, uh, if you look in Matthew 5, to whom is Jesus saying this? <coughs> Matthew 5, 1. The disciples, part of it, he went up on a mountain, uh, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, who's the them? Is it just the disciples, or is it presumably the crowd there, too? I've kind of always understood that this included the crowd, too, the multitudes, and then he goes through the Beatitudes in the, first, in the next verses. Um, and then notice verse 11, here he's building this analogy that we talked about of faith of being alone. Blessed are you when they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. So don't, don't be afraid to stand alone. That's part of what it means to be a, a believer. And then you are the salt of the earth. So this, this discussion seems to be had with a larger group, a multitude and the disciples together. That will affect the meaning as we'll see. All right, so first point, from Matthew's Gospel, there is a link between the illustration of salt and light. These two parables kind of seem to be getting at the exact same point. You're the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how will it be seasoned? What, what does that even mean? What, what does it mean to be salt? Not salty. What does it mean to be salt? So that's a hard thing about illustrations or comparisons or you know, similes, metaphors. It, it's it's kind of obvious, but really not at all obvious. Well, you know, what are, what are the characteristics of salt that might apply? It flavors stuff. It makes stuff taste better. Okay, so we're supposed to flavor the world. Um, it preserves. We're supposed to preserve things. Makes you thirsty for more. All right. Makes it better. Makes it better. Uh, salt is not something that, that kind of takes on its own flavor. It enhances other things, other flavors. Uh, salt is, you know, if, if you will, born that way. It's, uh, you know, it's... It's, it's, it's mind. It doesn't necessarily like become salty over time. It is what it is. It's made that way by God. Can salt lose its flavor? Jesus says if salt loses its flavor, is that even possible? Well, the short answer is no. But I did find this little uh, quote from a scientist a British one, so it must be right. Uh, as it is so chemically stable, sodium chloride will not lose its saltiness even after being stored dry for many years. However, there are ways in which salt may appear to lose its saltiness. Historically, salt has been obtained from crude sources such as salt marshes and minerals such as rock salt. This contains the stable sodium chloride plus other components. Sodium chloride is readily water soluble, so if this crude salt were exposed to condensation or rainwater, the sodium chloride could be dissolved and removed, and the salt could, in effect, lose its saltiness. All right. And they certainly had crude salt back then, I'm sure. So again, what, what is salt? You are the salt of the earth. Yes. Sometimes when you have salt too long, you can just keep salt and things and salt and things, and it doesn't. It doesn't really. You just finally have to buy new salt because it, it's not as salt. Maybe you had some crude salt that leached out its saltiness. 
have to buy the expensive stuff. Salt Lake, a couple of years ago, whole lake full of salt. I wanted to see how salty it really was, so I stopped by the side of the road, got a handful of dirt and tasted it. It wasn't salt, okay? So my children mock me mercilessly for wanting to see if, in fact, it was really salty in the area of the Great Salt Lake and by the salt flats. I don't know. To me, it makes perfect sense. And, and, uh, and just, just a warning, the stuff by the side of the road is not salty, just for future reference. Okay, see, so it's not weird at all. But you can't, okay. it can't sink. It can't sink when you swim. Yeah, right. Makes everything more buoyant. Yeah. But it, now, again, if you're, if you're hearing this and you don't have this kind of foundation of faith, what kind of sense is a statement like that going to make? Your salt. It's not going to make any sense. The only way this makes sense is if you have the Holy Spirit there leading you, and, and even then it's hard. That's a hard, a hard metaphor. Right, and put, put the big picture together. Yeah. And if we compare this with the next part of this, which is light, this idea of affecting other things becomes a big issue. Salt flavors other things. It makes everything else better. It's, you know, it's created by God. It's not a, a thing that does this in itself. It's, it's simply its nature to affect other things. Now you look at the light part of this in Matthew. Uh, verse 14 there, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Yeah, presumably a city with lots of lights in it at night. You know, so the light shining out. Again, this affecting others thing. That it, it, it's, it's, it's illuminating. Again, if you don't have faith, what sense does that make? Well, if you're a Christian, you understand. You're supposed to affect those around you. You're supposed to, you know, Christ working through you to, to help others and bring them eternal life. Not just help them, but ultimately to declare God's grace to them. So we season the world, we make things better by the proclamation of God's grace given to us. We shine in the world by the proclamation of God's grace. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. Again, the shining part seems to be the, the, the crux of the matter. So it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. Now, here's where, again, if you have a messed up analogy of faith like the Jews had, this would go in a completely wrong direction. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If, if your analogy of faith was that ultimately God loved you based on how well you're keeping the law, which is kind of what the Jews thought, and then Jesus throws this little bit in here about... Um, you know, that they may see your good works. You may very well come to the conclusion that the light he's talking about are your works, your good deeds, your obedience to the law. Let the world see how good you are, and that's your light. So if that's your analogy of faith, that's what you're going to see. But if your analogy of faith is Christ is the light of the world, you know, he's... He's the one that flavors everything and brings life and light and hope and joy. You know, we, we salt, we, we shine our light by pointing to him. If you're a Christian, that takes on a whole different meaning. All right, again, thoughts or comments there? Okay. Where are we? Ah, all right. Um... The light illustration then, yeah. So what aspect of light, uh, page three, the questions there right before point two, we've kind of hit most of these. What aspect of light did Jesus stress? The shining part of it. Um, yeah, and, but the negatives, we should note that in this comparison. What negative thing does he warn against? And how is it like the previous illustration? The, the thing about 
This is there is a strong negative undercurrent. It's not just, hey, do this, be this. It's if you're not this. If salt loses its flavor, it's good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And the, and the negatives, a city set on a hill, it can't be hidden. And you don't light a lamp and put it under a basket. So it's, it's there's a warning in that. So what's it warning against? It's warning against receiving Christ and not pointing to him, not confessing him. You know, not letting the faith you have flavor the world around you and bringing Christ to others. Not letting your understanding of Jesus' love and grace shine to those around you. And what Jesus says is if you're not out there, you know, flavoring the world with him, you're good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So this is exactly the problem that we read about with the rulers who believed in Jesus but were afraid to confess him lest they be thrown out of the synagogue. They were salt that wouldn't flavor anything. They were light that refused to shine. Exactly what Jesus is talking against. So really, this parable may very well have been aimed at kind of that faction. It's good that you believe, but that ain't the whole story. You have to believe and confess. You have to take a chance. You have to risk yourself. You know, if necessary, sacrifice yourself. Since, since we have Christ within us who was crucified. Uh, let's see, where are we at time? Um, yeah, so failing to confess Christ ultimately results in our rejection of the faith, our loss of our own soul. Now look at Mark's take on this, the second one on page 2, bottom of the page. And he also said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret that it should, not, or that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and you will hear, and, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Now, look in, in the actual Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. To whom is Jesus speaking this? Mark 4, 21, it says, He also told them. Who's the them? You've got to go back further. Well, look at verse 10. But when he was alone, those with him, with the twelve, asked him about the parable. So Jesus is teaching the parables to this closed group again. So the audience in Matthew was everybody, this multitude. The audience in Mark is this closed group where Jesus is explaining things more. Does that make a difference? Well, we'll see it. It actually does. Um, notice how the illustration is different here. What is, what's different about this from Matthew? How is, for, for one thing, in Matthew, The focus seems to be, especially with the sort of negative end of it, that if you don't do this, there's something wrong. The focus is on our outward confession of faith. You being salt and salting things. You being light and lighting things. It's about receiving the, the faith and confessing it. Is that the same thing Mark seems to be focusing on? Verse 22 there's nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret that it should not come to light. Now verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he said, take heed what you hear. It's a little different. This isn't just talking about 
the outward confession of faith and showing our faith to the world around us. This has something to do with hearing. What, for instance, let's see here. For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor is anything but kept secret that should not come to light. What's, what's that? What's he talking about there? What's hidden, nothing hidden that will not be revealed, or secret that should not come to light? What's the hidden or the secret thing? It's not new laws, it's the gospel. The hidden thing, it was hidden to the Jews. Again, God's plan of eternal life, how God's going to save you, by sending a son to sacrifice himself. They got the God sending a son thing, they got the Messiah thing, they didn't get the sacrificing himself in your place thing. So they, they didn't get the whole concept of the atonement, even though, mind-blowing thing, their entire sacrificial system was built on the concept. Everything about their sacrificial system was atonement, buying back, sacrificing for the sake of another, for the other. But they didn't connect that with the Messiah for some reason. So the hidden thing was an obvious thing that they weren't getting. God's going to save the world by sacrificing his son. That's the lamp. It's not just the outward confession. It is the gospel itself. And 23, if you have ears to hear, hear it. What's that if you have ears to hear? If you have faith. If you have faith, you know, listen to this. This isn't for people without faith because they're not going to get it. It's hidden from them. It's, a, it's out of their reach from logic. But, but what really gets me is this 24 thing. Take heed what you hear. Because this is not the way we normally read this verse. That with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. How is that usually used? If somebody says to you, the same measure you use is going to be measured back to you, how do you take that? Something you do. That's right. If you want people to be nice to you, be nice to them. That's what we, we tell our kids. So the same measure you use is going to be measured back to you. We usually associate that, that saying with our works, our deeds, or even what we say. You want people to talk to you, talk nice to you, talk nice to them. You want people to respect you, you've got to respect them. So it's always generating what, what we have, and that will come back to us. Certainly can mean forgiveness. If you want somebody to forgive you, you better be willing to forgive them. Same measure you use. But how's Jesus using that here? It's not that. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said, take heed what you hear. That, that hear thing is just a weird word in there. You know, if we, were to, if we were to put, take heed what you do, then it might make more sense. With the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Or, you know, what you say, then it might make sense. Take heed what you say, because the same measure you use. Or judge, that's how this is often used. You know, take heed how you judge, because the same measure you use is going to be measured back to you. That's not what he says. It's hear. Take heed what you hear. So how does the hearing connect to the measuring? Because it's a, he brackets it. And to you who hear, more will be given. gospel thing like you hit on. What, what was it again that the whole point of this light thing, what is the light he's talking about? It's the gospel itself. It's Christ himself. Take heed what you hear. Jesus. Forgiveness. Eternal life. Grace. You know, that's this whole analogy of faith of a loving, gracious God. Take heed that you're hearing the right things. And then this measuring thing. You know, the same measure you use measuring life in terms of grace. 
measuring life in terms of Christ's love and mercy and what, that, what that's supposed to mean for our lives. That's how we measure the world. Not, it's, it's not based on us, not what we do, what we say, how we judge. It's on, it's on Christ. With the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. If we live in faith, seeing Christ's hands in things, measuring our life and our world based on the, the mercy and love of God, then it's the mercy and love of God that defines us. And then to him who has more will be given. If you have faith, if you have Christ, you'll be getting more, eternal life. Whoever doesn't have this, even what he has will be taken away from them. You don't have Christ, there's nothing else. There's no eternal life. There's hell. So it's only when we understand this in terms of Jesus himself that this makes any sense. And again, it's slightly different than the Matthew parable, which was more about our confession of faith. So again, these, just because it's a similar illustration doesn't necessarily mean the meaning is the same if the context has changed a little. And it has changed between Matthew and Mark. This isn't a re, Mark isn't a repeating of Matthew. This is two different events. All right, and then finally, we'll just close with the Luke thing. Luke virtually mirrors Mark. So uh, Luke and Mark are, are a retelling of the same event. Verse 22, last question in, let's see, where was it? Luke 20, Luke? Lost my page. Nope, nope. Where'd it go? There it is. Luke... Not Luke 22, it's got to be Mark. Mark 22. Yeah, is this law or gospel? There's nothing hidden that will not be revealed, nor is anything but conceived. Is that what I'm driving at? Uh, yeah, verse 22 in Mark, or verse 17 in Luke. For nothing secret that will not be revealed, or, or anything hidden that will not be known. Is that law or gospel? It's gospel because it's there for everyone. It is, it's referencing the gospel, yes. The secret thing is the gospel, and it's, it's revealed. It's there for, for anyone with faith to see. And even though it's hidden from humanity, it's ultimately, ultimately all humanity is going to know this at the second coming. But All right. So, any comments or questions or anything about today's parable? All right, then let's close with prayer. Gracious Father, we do thank you for the son that you have given us and pray that the faith that he has brought us might strengthen and grow, that you might grant us understanding from your word, helping us not only know within ourselves but confess you openly in this world. Grant us this, Jesus, for your sake. Amen.